good afternoon everyone i'll be covering the surgical anatomy of the orbit and the basic concepts of fractures so basically the orbit is like a four sided pyramid um, so it is like a four sided pyramid in the three dimensional view with the opening at the level of the orbital entrance but as we go behind the orbital floor merges with the medial wall of the orbit and towards the apex the orbital cavity becomes triangular in shape as we can see in two dimensional view the anterior section of the orbit is quadra quadrangular shape cross section because of all the four walls how uh, whereas when we go towards the orbital apex the cross section becomes triangle in shape now for the surgical point of view the bony orbit is divided into uh, three basic components the orbital rim the walls and the apex coming to the rim the superior orbital rim is formed by the frontal bone and it is continuous with the posterior lacrimal crest the lateral orbital rim above is formed by the frontal bone and below by the zygomatic bone the inferior rim laterally is formed by the zygomatic bone and medially by the maxillary bone and the medial portion of the rim is formed by the maxillary bone and the lacrimal bone uh, the at the orbital entrance the dimensions are 40 mm horizontally and 35 mm vertically and the distance of the lateral orbital rim to the apex is 4 to 4.5 cm and the anterior lacrimal crest to the orbital apex is 4.4 to 5 cm the two medial walls of the orbit are parallel to each other and at a distance of 2.5 cm from each other the lateral orbital walls they form 90 degree angle to each other the entire orbital volume is 30 cm cube now this is an important point uh, the widest area of the orbital cavity is just from behind the rim 1.5 cm away this is very well appreciated in the sagittal plane and it is also called the post entry concavity it is said that this is the transition zone when the thick orbital rim uh, bones they actually transit into thin orbital walls coming to the internal orbit which is the orbital walls and the apex it can further be divided into anterior third the middle third and the posterior third the anterior third which is also called the anterior section it starts from just behind the rim up to the anterior loop of the inferior orbital fissure the area of the orbit between this anterior entry of the fissure to the confluence of the inferior orbital fissure with the superior orbital fissure this area is called the mid, mid orbit or the middle third of the orbit and behind this confluence is the posterior third of the orbit or the orbital apex coming to the orbital walls the orbit is formed by seven bones Uh, the the roof is formed by the frontal bone in the front and behind by the lesser wing of the sphenoid the lateral wall is formed by the zygomatic bone and behind by the greater wing of the sphenoid the floor is formed laterally by the zygomatic bone medially by the maxillary bone and a small portion is formed by the palatine bone which is also called the posterior ledge i will be discussing this in detail the medial wall is formed by the frontal process of maxillary bone the lacrimal bone the ethmoid bone and the body of the sphenoid bone now coming to the orbital roof it is concave in shape it separates the orbital cavity from the anterior cranial fossa uh, the sagittal plane shows the uh, the sagittal plane shows the shape of the roof which is concave just behind the rim then it goes backwards and finally dips towards the apex now the shape is very important while reconstructing the orbit orbital roof the lesser wing of the sphenoid harbors the optic foramen which contains the optic nerve The roof also gives attachment to trochlea nasally and lacrimal gland anterior laterally. Uh, medial wall, as I've discussed, is formed by the phone bones, the fr frontal process of the maxilla, the lacrimal bone, the ethmoid bone, and the body of the sphenoid. And it is the thinnest of all the walls, 0.2 to 0.4 millimeter thick, and hence the lamina papyracea is commonly involved in the medial blowout fractures. The most important landmark here is the frontoethmoidal suture, which marks the base of the anterior cranial fossa or the roof of the ethmoid air cells. It has the anterior ethmoidal foramen, which is 24 millimeters behind the anterior lacrimal crest. The posterior ethmoidal foramen is 12 millimeters behind the anterior foramen, and the optic canal is 6 millimeters behind the posterior foramen, and all of them lie in the same vertical plane. so while we are dissecting we know that we should not go above this for um, uh, uh, beyond this foramen so the safe limit is 35 mm along the medial wall and we should not go above this suture line the another important point here is the ethmoidal vessels they transmit through these foramen so we should take care of the bleeding while dissecting along this plane um 
Another important landmark is the posterior lacrimal crest. It provides attachment to the horners, muscles, and the septum orbital. So when we are repairing the medial orbital wall fractures, we are giving a transcaruncular incision. When we go, when we hit, uh, we directly hit at the posterior lacrimal crest if we are going through the caruncle, and then the plane of dissection is between the horner's muscle and the septum orbitales. Orbital floor, as I've already said, it's triangular in shape and shortest wall. Uh, now the shape of the orbital floor is the most important thing. The first thing when the floor merges with the medial wall is the posterior medial bulge. The second important thing in the sagittal section we can see is the S-shaped contour. That is first there is a concavity, then it further moves upwards and inclines upwards towards the apex. And third important thing, as I discussed, there is a transition zone behind the mid-orbit uh, where the quadrangular shape of the orbit becomes a triangular shape. So this is a key area. And all the three points, the posterior medial bulge, the S-shaped contour, and the key area, they, are fundamental, they have a fundamental impact on the globe position. There are three important structures along the orbital floor which need to be looked for. Uh, the orbital plate of the palatine bone which is forming the posterior ledge, it is a reliable and a stable landmark uh, because if it is intact, it helps in correct volumetric assessment and reconstruction of the posterior orbit. However, if it is absent, then reconstruction of the posterior orbit has to be performed rigidly in view of orbital cone so that it does not widen post-surgery. The second important landmark is this intraorbital buttress, which is the frontoethmoidal suture, um, which is the maxillary ethmoidal suture. It is a tiny bony brace at the confluence of the medial orbital wall with the floor running from anterior section to the apex, and it merges with the posterior ledge. It is very important as it helps in assessment of the severity of intraorbital injury, and it is an important landmark if it is undisplaced. The third is the inferior orbital fissure. It is 20 millimeters long. It is present between the lateral wall and the floor of the orbit, and it connects the orbit with the pterygopalatine and the infratemporal fossa. It transmits a maxillary division of trigeminal nerves, the zygomatic nerves, sphenopalatine ganglion branches, and branches of the inferior ophthalmic vein. Now coming to this diagram, this is the uh, inferior orbital fissure. This is the infraorbital nerve which passes from the posterior part of the fissure comes into the infraorbital groove, then passes through the canal, and finally comes out through the infraorbital foramen, which is one centimeter below the rim. Now, while dissecting in this plane, we need to take care that infraorbital nerve is not damaged, as it can lead to numbness of the cheek and the upper teeth, but in many cases, it is involved in the fractures. So in that case, you need to counsel the patient. Another important structure which passes through this groove is the infraorbital artery, which also sometimes gives you a tough time when it bleeds. Uh, now, this, infra, this infraorbital nerve in the artery area it divides the orbit into a medial thin part and a lateral thick part. Hence, this is the area which is very commonly involved in orbital blowout fractures. Coming to a few clinical examples, this is the left eye orbital uh, fro floor fracture with the intact buttress and intact inf inferior orbital fissure. As we can see here, the inferior orbital fissure is intact, the posterior ledge is intact, and the buttress is intact. So in this case, the implant has to be put over here, and the inferior orbital fissure is intact, so we don't need to cover this. In the second example, this is a, last, uh, this is a large orbital floor fracture which is involving the inferior orbital fissure. So in this case, we need to obliterate the inferior orbital fissure with the implant, otherwise it leads to residual enophthalmos. And we can place the implant over the intact posterior ledge and the buttress. This is the third example which shows the buttress is also displaced, so here we no longer can use it as a landmark. This is the sagittal section which is showing the um, S-shaped contour of the floor which is very important for the normal globe position. So in case of fracture, this contour is lost, but uh, in this case, we can see the posterior ledge. So the implant is placed from this place to the posterior ledge so that we can um, basically create this S-shaped contour. Lateral wall, lateral wall is thickest of all the walls and it is separated from the roof by superior orbital fissure and from the floor by the inferior orbital fissure. An important landmark is a Wittnall's tubercle which gives attachment to the lateral canthal tendon and this Wittnall's tubercle is present one centimeter inferior to the frontozygomatic suture. So when we give swinging eyelid incision and orbital fracture repair, uh, when we need more exposure, so cantholysis is performed. We need to reattach the canthal tendon to this Wittnall's tubercle. Uh, the last part is the orbital apex. Uh, it is behind the confluence of inferior and superior orbital fissure, and it has uh, superior orbital fissure and the orbi uh, optic foramen. Superior orbital fissure is 22 millimeters in length, which connects the orbit to the middle cranial fossa, and uh, there are various cranial nerves which pass to it. 
an optic foramen is present within the uh, lesser wing of the sphenoid bone and it is separated from the superior orbital fissure with the help of this optic strut which is again a part of lesser wing of sphenoid and this strut is susceptible to damage. Uh, this is just a diagram showing the safe, uh, safe limit of dissection like along the nasal and superior wall we can go up to 30 millimeters and along the lateral and the inferior wall we can go up to 35 to 40 millimeters. I've already discussed the dimensions. Coming to periorbita, it is a periosteal lining of the orbits and firmly attached to the suture line and the fissures, but it is very helpful as it gives us a surgical plane because it can be lifted off very easily. Um, little bit about basics of the fractures. So how do we define fracture? It is mainly a cortical bone disruption and displacement on the other, other hand is the aberrance of the shape of the injured wall as compared to the uninjured wall. So in case of orbit, the displacement needs to be interpreted as a defect as it leads to increase in orbital volume. But since the bones of the orbital wall are thin, displacement of the orbital wall in most of the cases is associated with fragmentation. The orbital fracture can follow any of the three patterns. Either it can be a linear fracture where a clear cut fracture line can be seen on the CT scan. It can be an orbital wall defect where the bony wall is missing and the orbital structures are displaced into the wall or it can be defect like a lamellar fracture which is the most difficult case to detect and they are often underestimated on CT scan because they just produce dents and tubs but they flow smoothly in continuity with the undisplaced part of the orbit. However, such fractures do cause changes in the volume. Every 1 cc increase in volume leads to 0.77 millimeters of enophthalmos. Classification of fractures, it can be simple or complex orbital fractures. The simple orbital fractures can be blowout fractures which are pure blowout fractures when only the walls are involved and the rim are intact. They can involve either the floor medial wall or floor or medial wall in combination, white head fractures or roof blowout fractures. The term blowout was given by Smith and Regan. They can be pure blow-in fractures or they can be impure blow-in or blow-out fractures where the wall along with the rim is involved. The complex orbital fractures can be ZMC fracture, nasoorbitoethmoidal fracture, cranioorbital fracture, orbitofacial fracture, leaf 4, 2, and 3, and panfacial fractures. These are the leaf 4, 2, and 3 fractures which involve the orbit. Mechanism of blowout fracture, the earlier theory was the buckling theory when the force was given on the rim and because of this buckling of the rim, the force was transmitted to the floor or the medial wall and fracture occurred. However, the more accepted theory is the hydraulic theory given by FIFA. Uh, he says that object larger than the horizontal diameter of the orbit leads to raised intraorbital pressure which causes the giving way of the orbital floor or the medial wall and the herniation of the contents into the respective sinuses. And when the pressure falls back, the tissues can recoil back and might get entrapped in the fracture site, not always. The mechanism of blow-in fracture is the primary force is directed at the orbital rim and those fragments are directed inward towards the roof. Most commonly it is seen in orbital roof fractures. So in conclusion, I would say although orbital fractures are not themselves light threatening, they may be associated with intracranial or ocular injuries that require emergency management. Thank you.